So I'm going to talk first about an overview of peritoneal dialysis and basically how it works and then focus on complications related to this in the, in the second of the two talks. So here's my disclosures. Next slide. Okay. So a patient starts on peritoneal dialysis and has a peritoneal equilibration test that shows that the dialysis to plasma ratio of creatinine after a four hour dwell is 90%. And this is a high or a rapid transporter. So what's the big deal about this? Which one of these statements is the most correct? The D over P creatinine is an important predictor of adequacy of dialysis. The PET at two months was performed too soon after the start of PD. There may be problems with ultrafiltration, especially during the long dwell of dialysis fluid, or the, the uh, particular dialysis fluid, icodextrin, is not particularly useful for patients with rapid or high transport status. Anything jump out at you? C, good. So why is this the case? Let's zone in a little bit on what actually happens during peritoneal dialysis. So on your left, you have the blood side of the equation, which is the capillary networks that are perfusing the peritoneal cavity. You have the peritoneal membrane and the dialysate compartment, the peritoneal compartment on the right. <clears throat> and remember, this is a biological dialyzing membrane. So let's zone in even more closely on the interface. So you've got the blood side on your left. You've got the endothelial cells that line all these capillaries, some interstitial tissue, the peritoneal membrane that you feel the pop when you put a, a PD catheter through, and then mesothelial cells that line the peritoneal cavity, and then the PD fluid itself. So how does solute get from the blood compartment into the peritoneal fluid? Well, just like hemodialysis, it's by diffusion and convection during ultrafiltration. And for those of you who at this point are still aren't very clear about it, you've got an example of convection on your left and diffusion on the right. So how, does, how do solutes actually diffuse? Well, right at the beginning, when you put in fresh PD fluid, the diffusive flux is going to be the highest because the concentration gradient is the greatest. And we just know that after about a four-hour dwell, urea is pretty well equilibrated. 90% or more of the urea will be equilibrated. In other words, the concentration of urea in the dialysis fluid will be 90% or greater the concentration in the blood. Creatinine being a bigger and slower moving solute is more around 60% equilibrated, but it varies from person to person and within the same person over time. Because again, we're dealing with a biological dialyzing membrane. So if you leave fluid in longer than four hours, you're not going to remove any more urea or not much more urea. However, you will continue to remove the more slow, slower moving larger, less diffusible solutes. <clears throat> and here is just a, a schema of that. You see that urea you, on the y-axis is the dialysis to plasma ratio of the solute in, uh, that, of concern, and one means that it's completely equilibrated. So you have urea that's rapidly diffusible. And, and it equilibrates, creatinine moves more slowly, and the middle molecules are basically time dependent. They're bigger and slower moving, so it takes longer for them to cross into the peritoneal fluid. But that's why something like a long day dwell, although it's not gonna remove much more urea, is very good for middle molecule removal because it's a long time of contact between the PD fluid and the blood compartment. Now, the biological membrane is actually a bi-directional membrane, so stuff goes the other way, too. And we know that you can add stuff to the dialysis fluid, and it will diffuse in the opposite direction from the dialysis into the blood. So antibiotics, which you well know are used for the treatment of PD peritonitis, many of them go into the blood and give very therapeutic concentrations. And as a rule, we try to avoid PIC lines in our PD patients if they've got 
got something that needs, for example, six weeks of vancomycin, we will give it to them intraperitoneally and monitor serum vancomycin levels. So things can go from the PD fluid into the blood. There's a list of other things too that have been put in and again will diffuse in the opposite direction because it's a bidirectional membrane. What about fluid removal in PD? It's produced by osmotic and also sometimes oncotic pressure in distinction to hemodialysis where it's by hydraulic pressure as you know. But the results are just the same. You get removal of fluid and convective removal of solutes, uh, relatively more important for the larger sized solutes. These are the different PD solutions based on dextrose that are currently in use in the United States, the 1.5, 2.5 and 4.25% dextrose solutions, and they build up osmolality or tonicity by greater amounts of dextrose. So here's, uh, in, I always found in high school, I learned about all these things by having a two compartment uh, 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 set up, separated by a bi-directional semi-permeable membrane. That's how we were taught about diffusion and osmosis and stuff like that. And that's a good way to think about the peritoneal cavity. So on your right is the peritoneal cavity. On the left is the blood compartment. Again, the sum total of all the capillaries that are perfusing the peritoneal cavity. And if you put in a fluid that is hyperosmotic to uremic plasma, you have established an osmotic gradient. And you know that water will move from an area of lower to higher osmolality. But it doesn't just move as distilled water, but drags along solutes with it. So that's how ultrafiltration works in peritoneal dialysis. The osmolality is built up with dextrose. Now, unfortunately, dextrose itself will diffuse across from the peritoneal cavity along its concentration gradient into the blood. So although the dextrose concentration is really high right at the beginning and you've got a really good osmotic gradient, that will tend to dissipate over the, the time of the dwell as you lose those osmoles. So this is what a typical ultrafiltration curve will look like with rapid ultrafiltration right at the beginning, but at some point when you reach osmotic equilibrium, there will be no further ultrafiltration filtration. In fact, there is ongoing lymphatic drainage out of the peritoneal cavity, which is always working against ultrafiltration, and therefore you will start to lose your ultrafiltration volume, and if you leave the fluid in long enough, you'll end up with net reabsorption. So for example, a CAPD patient may put in a two-liter bag overnight before they go to sleep and get up in the morning and drain out and have less than the two liters because of net reabsorption due to the long dwell. So we just know from having done this on lots of people that the average ultrafiltration uh, or the maximum ultrafiltration with a 1.5% is about 300 mils and that occurs at, after about a two hour dwell. However, because patients leave the fluid in longer than that, it tends to come out neutral or even a little bit of absorption. With the more hypertonic solutions, and here I give the example of the 4.25%, maximum ultrafiltration is a liter, and the time to this maximum ultrafiltration is about four hours, okay? I underscore that, a liter of ultrafiltration in about a four-hour dwell. So if a 4.25% leads to this kind of ultrafiltration, and you realize that a liter over four hours averages out to about 250 mils of ultrafiltration an hour, why is it that when PD patients are admitted to the intensive care unit for fluid removal, people immediately go and put in a line for hemodialysis? And for the life of me, I don't know. So you've got to really remember this, that people seem to be so reluctant to use a 4. 0.25% because they're worried about the sugar or something like that, but they're not so reluctant to stick a line into a major vein and attach a patient to a machine to do the same thing. So keep that in mind, and even in my hospital with a big peritoneal dialysis presence, the ICU people just like do what they do, and it's just reflex for them to want to put the person on hemo to remove fluid, and really you should try hypertonic PD solution first in a PD patient.
So this is just uh, some curves showing you the different kinds of uh, ultrafiltration curves. In red, the 1.5, yellow 2.5, and uh, blue, the 4.2, or green, the 4.25% solutions. But again, this is a biological membrane and it varies from patient to patient. So to put it together for ultrafiltration in PD, how much you're going to ultrafilter depends on the strength of the solution you use, how long you leave it in, shorter versus longer, and the intrinsic patient's permeability to glucose and other solutes. <clears throat> and again, in hemodialysis, whether you take that kidney or that kidney off the shelf, they're all the same. In peritoneal dialysis, it's a little more interesting because one patient may vary from the next. And that is why we have the peritoneal equilibration test, which characterizes the peritoneal membrane. It doesn't tell you how much dialysis the patient's getting, but it just tells you what kind of a transporting membrane or dialyzing membrane the patient has. And basically what you do is you put in PD fluid at time equals zero. Now at time equals zero, you've got two big gradients here. You've got all that creatinine in the blood and no creatinine in the dialysis fluid, and you've got all that sugar in the dialysis fluid, which is less than that in the blood. So things are going to diffuse along their concentration gradient, creatinine from the blood into the PD fluid, and glucose in the opposite direction. And how quickly or easily this happens is what the dialysis to plasma creatinine ratio is all about. And the leakier the peritoneal membrane, the higher the D over P creatinine. Now, I use the word leakier as if there's like big holes in the peritoneal membrane. And in fact, in truth, this just means that there's probably more capillary networks that are open and able to take part in this uh, solute and fluid exchange. And that's what makes a, 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 a rapid transporter a rapid transporter. So here's the rapid transporter. They will have a higher D over P creatinine at the end of a four-hour dwell, and a slower transporter who, again, has fewer open capillary networks perfusing the peritoneal cavity will have a lower D over P creatinine at the end of four hours. And this is shown here. These are studies that have been done on lots of patients many years ago. The rapid transporters in red, the slow transporters in purple, and in between, in between. And <clears throat> you can see that urea being so small and easily diffusible is not really a great discriminator among the different transport groups. So because of that, people use creatinine. And you can see that the rapid transporters have a four-hour D over P creatinine somewhere between 80% and 100%. <clears throat> So unfortunately, the more rapid transporter, sure, creatinine crosses faster, so that sounds like good news. But in fact, glucose also leaves the peritoneal fluid faster. And that means that the osmotic gradient for ultrafiltration is also going to dissipate faster. Now, that's interesting. Why is a patient a rapid or a slow transporter right from the get-go? And it's interesting that rapid transporters it is associated with their having higher levels of C-reactive protein, lower serum albumins even before they start on PD, less residual kidney function. Sometimes it's been found to be more common in diabetics. So it suggests that the rapid transporter status may be a marker of a patient that has higher levels of systemic inflammation. And some of the studies that suggest that rapid transporters do less well, one of the reasons might be because they happen to be more inflamed patients. Just like of all starters, those with a higher C-reactive protein tend to do less well. The slow transporters, on the other hand, sure, stuff doesn't cross very quickly, but that means that the glucose that you put in in the PD fluid hangs around longer and therefore causes ultrafiltration longer, and therefore you get better ultrafiltration. So on your left now, you've got the drain volume after a two-liter fill. And just to show you that the rapid transporters in red have the lowest drain volume, even some absorption whereas the purple slow transporters or low transporters have got the best drain volume for the reasons I, I just explained.
So really, it, they used to be called high and low transporters because it was thought that those with the leakier peritoneal membrane removed way more solutes than those that, that didn't. But in fact, when you factor in ultrafiltration removal of solute, because the slow transporters have better ultrafiltration, in fact, they're going to make up what they don't have in diffusive flux with better convective flux of solute because they have more ultrafiltration. And that is why there, in the end there may not be that much difference in total solute removal when you add in the diffusive and the convective flux. What one loses in one, it gains in the other. So coming back to the original question, you were right, C is the best answer. D over P creatinine is not a predictor of, of adequacy of dialysis. It depends how much dialysis you give them. The PET test, uh, people advise that you wait one month after insertion of the peritoneal catheter because the insertion itself can lead to a little temporary inflammation and it may make the PET test inaccurate. So most people will, will you should wait wait at least a month after insertion of a catheter to do the PET test. In this case, it was done two months later. And we'll talk about icodextrin. It is part, it can be useful for this type of transport status. So the correct answer is uh, C. And that's just what I've said uh, in your slide here. Okay. This is a patient who starts on night cycler peritoneal dialysis. And because everyone thinks that KT over V urea is the be all and end all, the nephrologist wants to impress the large dialysis organization and CMS by having a super high KT over V urea and therefore prescribes five cycles over nine hours with a 2.5% dialysis fluid. Because again, urea is so small and easily diffusible that the more fluid you put in, the more uh, urea you will remove. Unfortunately, the patient complains of thirst in the morning and has to drink several glasses of water, basically drinking back a lot of the ultrafiltration that occurred the night before. So what's the best answer here? The patient has sleep apnea, mouth breathing, and is thirsty. The patient may be hypernatremic because of sodium sieving during this rapid exchange PD. The glucose absorption overnight increases serum osmolality, which drives thirst, or it may be resetting of the osmostat. I'm hearing B and C? B. It's too bad all these letters rhyme with each other. Okay. So going a little more detail about this interface, it is the endothelial cells that line the capillaries that are the main regulators of transperitoneal transport. And there are three main pores that seems to explain how stuff gets across. So you can see the endothelial cells there. And between the endothelial cells here, the inter-endothelial cells, there are these large pores, or there may be smaller pores. And it's in fact the small pores that are mainly responsible for most of the solute and water removal. But there are also aquaporins or transcellular pores that go right through the endothelial cell. They open, you know about aquaporins, for example, in the cortical collecting tubule of the kidney driven by ADH. These are different aquaporins. They're not driven by ADH, but they are driven by osmosis. Osmolality. So if you put a hyperosmolar fluid into the peritoneal cavity, it opens up these aquaporins in the endothelial cells, and they will remove water. So if you put in a hyperosmolar solution, you've got your osmotic gradient, you activate the aquaporins, and a lot of the ultrafiltration that you get in the early part of the dwell is only water. More slowly, you've got salt and water moving in the inter-endothelial cell pores. But in the short dwells, about 50% of the ultrafiltration is water only. And what happens if you remove more water than sodium to the patient? They're going to become hypernatremic. And what happens if they're hypernatremic? They're thirsty. What if you tell them not to drink? It's like saying, stop breathing, everybody here, stop breathing, okay? You can't. If you're hypernatremic, you will drink yourself back to normal tonicity.
So more water than sodium moves in with these short wells, and sodium is held back or sieved at the level of the aquaporin. It's only water that can get through there. Sodium does diffuse into the PD fluid, but it does it more slowly through the interendothelial cell pores. So if you're doing, this is one of the many reasons not to do rapid exchanges in peritoneal dialysis. It will drive up the KT over V urea, but big deal. It's got a lot of uh, downsides, including sodium sieving. And this is just one study from uh, Spain that looked at patients who were on CAPD in the uh, big red box on the left and were switched to rapid cycling, and they actually measured peritoneal sodium removal and found that it was less with the rapid cycling on APD because of the sodium sieving. So the best answer here is B, that the patient may be hypernatremic in the morning because of those rapid exchanges and sodium sieving. Okay, again, this is a common exam question. Aquaporins allow only aqua to go across the endothelial cells. And rapid exchanges with hypertonic dialysis fluid may give you great ultrafiltration, but most of that ultrafiltration, or a lot of that ultrafiltration, is water. And really, the patient will just end up being hypernatremic and drink back the water. So there is a different kind of PD solution called icodextrin, which works by colloid osmosis. And uh, the way I think about colloid uh, osmosis is like what albumin does in the vascular bed. And we know that uh, even though the osmolality inside the vascular compartment is the same as the osmolality outside of the vascular compartment, the thing that the vessels have is albumin that is stuck inside the vessels. And that induces an oncotic pressure that pulls fluid up from the interstitial into the plasma compartment. That's just like Starling's uh, forces. So again, with a dextrose-based solution, you've got your dextrose-induced higher osmolality on the right. It opens up aquaporins. You get a lot of movement, about 50% of the ultrafiltration occurring through the aquaporins, and 50% through the small interendothelial cell pores. Icodextrin, because it, does, it isn't hyperosmotic, it induces an oncotic pressure, so it doesn't open up the aquaporins, so the only ultrafiltration you're getting is through the interendothelial cell pores, and therefore water and sodium are moving through that in a roughly uh, uh, isonatric way. So there's no aquaporin activation. So a liter of ultrafiltration with a dextrose-based solution is going to have a sodium concentration somewhere half of normal, because half of it is coming through the aquaporins, whereas a liter of ultrafiltration with icodextrin, because it's all coming through the interendothelial cell pores, will have a roughly iso isonatric co uh, concentration. So there's more bang for your ultrafiltration buck in in terms of sodium removal by using the icodextrin. It's got a different tempo of ultrafiltration too. Whereas I showed you before, this is a 4.25% glucose rapid ultrafiltration at the beginning and then a slow drop off. Icodextrin is really slow and steady as she goes. And the longer you leave the, the fluid in, the more ultrafiltration you get. So to me, it's kind of like the hare and the tortoise. You remember the hare quickly ran out of the gate but got tired, whereas the tortoise was slow and steady and eventually won the race. And so the hare is a dextrose-based solution, and the tortoise is like icodextrin. Okay, let's focus on Marvin, who is on APD, two and a half liters times three exchanges over eight hours, and a last fill of two liters. Uh, he ultrafilters about 800 mils, and he, has, uh, he absorbs a little bit of his last fill when he goes on the cycler at night. Let me just explain to you initial drain volume to make sure you understand this. So when people are on the cycler at night, they can come off the cycler in the morning empty, 
or they can have a last fill with something. If they keep that last fill in all day, let's say they're on eight hours overnight, that means that last fill will be in for about 16 hours during the day. So it's very likely that there's going to be some reabsorption given how long that dwell is. So in Marvin's case, he had a two liter last fill, and when he goes back on the machine again at night, he drains out what's left, that's the initial drain, and it's 1,700 mils. So in other words, he's absorbed about 300 mils during the day. So here I'm not looking for the true statement, I'm looking for the false statement. So he's protected from volume overload because of his residual urine volume. Yes, I think that's reasonable. He has borderline adequacy and should have his dialysis prescription increased or be converted to hemo. He should be advised to avoid nephrotoxic insults, such as obvious nephrotoxic drugs. And eight hours of APD is appropriate for many patients. I don't know how nine hours became the default time for APD. I don't spend nine hours in bed every night. I'm sure you don't spend nine hours in bed every night. I don't know how nine hours is what always comes up on people's uh, prescriptions. So this is the wrong answer. He's on a very generous PD regimen. He's got a lot of residual kidney function. I wouldn't even think twice about whether he's getting enough peritoneal dialysis on this kind of regimen. He could probably even do better with a, a lower PD regimen if this was proving onerous for him. So the strength of PD lies in a lot of stuff. It's, uh, you know, the hemodialysis world has suddenly uh, discovered that longer, slower, more frequent hemodialysis seems to be better for patients. Well, this is one of the strengths of PD is that it's continuous dialysis. There's better preservation of the residual kidney function compared to hemodialysis, and there's good middle molecule clearance both by the residual kidney function and by the more porous peritoneal membrane. And none of these advantages of PD is captured by KT over V urea. This is a randomized controlled trial called the ADAMX trial that looked at two different doses of KT over V urea, a very well carried out trial. And the relative risk of death between those with the higher versus the regular KT over V urea or creatinine clearance was 1.00, an absolutely neutral trial. And this was supposed to be the trial that was going to prove that KT over V urea was important in peritoneal dialysis. There was a similar study, randomized controlled trial out of Hong Kong around the same time that was also a negative study for KT over V. So the so-called adequacy guidelines, the last KDOKI iteration, suggested a minimum KT over V urea, renal and peritoneal, and do use the renal function both to guide your prescription and also if you have to report these numbers to anyone. PD is usually an elective start in an educated patient and they have a lot of residual kidney function. And if they come to you with like eight or 10 mils per minute of residual GFR, you can give them the easiest prescription, one that fits into their lifestyle and work from there. And they will feel better with that prescription. You don't have to give them the same kind a prescription that you give someone who's anuric. You should try to protect the residual kidney function, and I always say treat your dialysis patients who have residual kidney function just like you would a CKD3 or 4 patient. If you wouldn't dream of giving your CKD4 patient indomethacin, don't give it to your dialysis patient who has residual kidney function. If you would think long and hard before subjecting them to a contrast study, it's the same thing here, and so on. So that's really uh, where we are with adequate it shouldn't be KT over V urea, but unfortunately it is. Fluid balance and peritoneal dialysis, intake versus output. The output is either PD ultrafiltration or the residual urine volume. And, you know, it can be too much intake or too little output. The too little output can be loss of the residual kidney function, the use of the wrong kind of dialysis fluid, something wrong with the dialyzing membrane itself or true ultrafiltration failure, and mechanical problems like leaks of PD fluid out of the peritoneal compartment.
So PD is advertised as uh, having a more liberal intake of sodium and potassium. And in fact, that's absolutely true. It's daily dialysis. These people tend to have a lot of residual kidney function. They can pretty well eat and drink what they want. It's kind of the honeymoon period. And in fact, if they keep their residual kidney function, it can continue to be a honeymoon period. The problem is that if the urine volume diminishes, then they can run into problems. And the loss of residual kidney function is variable and unpredictable. I have patients who have been on PD for eight years who still pee a liter of urine a day. Other patients lose their residual urine volume within six months. So you have to monitor their urine volume. So that's the commonest cause of progressive fluid overload, and as I said, it's very unpredictable. So just treat them like you would your CKD3 or 4 patients. Avoid things that you would in those patients. We use a lot of diuretics to flog the kidneys to pee out salt and water as part of volume management. It's not a KT over V issue, it's a volume issue, and uh, we'd rather see the patients. And the patients themselves would rather pee out the volume, then have to use more dialysis or stronger bags to pull out the volume by ultrafiltration. We also and others have a policy of continuing low-level immunosuppression in patients with a failed renal allograft who need to come to peritoneal dialysis but still have, let's say, a liter of urine a day from the, the so-called failed renal allograft. We don't give up on that transplant function. The use of the wrong type of, tea, of PD fluid usually means that you're, you're having some problem with the long dwell and the reabsorption. So that long dwell is during the daytime in cycler dialysis and overnight in CAPD patients. So what can you do about that long dwell to try to keep up the volume status? Well, you can use the tortoise, you can use icodextrin or a more hypertonic dialysis fluid. You can break up the long dwell. The easiest thing to do, if the patient has got five mils per minute or more of residual GFR, is just leave the patient dry during the day. So let them do their cycler at night, and instead of coming off with fluid that you have to worry about whether it's going to absorb during the day, is to let them come off dry. And then you don't have to worry about any fluid absorption. Uh, many patients do what's called enhanced CCPD, and they do a midday exchange, which of course doesn't have to be exactly in the middle of the day. It might be when they come home from work or school or whatever, and that refreshes the osmotic gradient by draining out the, the used effluent and putting in fresh PD fluid. So there's lots of different things that you can do. It's good to do it in conversation with the patient to see what fits in to their lifestyle. Or, like I said, it may not need any intervention. Any intervention. So I have the example, example here of a patient who comes off the cycler with two liters in. They keep it in all day. When they go on the cycler at night, their initial drain is 1.5 liters. So in other words, they've absorbed 0.5 of a liter. But you know what? You think they're clinically euvolemic, they're peeing and stuff, so I would just leave it. You might realize that in the future, when they lose their residual urine, output that the fact that they're absorbing 500 mils every day may become a problem. But for now, it's not a problem. And then finally, true membrane failure and mechanical failure of the dialysis uh, uh, procedure itself. So true membrane failure, you can test by that by using a 4.25%. Leave it in for four hours. You should ultrafilter 400 mils or more. As I showed you, you'll probably ultrafilter way more than that. But the minimum is that you should ultrafilter 400 mils after the four-hour dwell. And if it's less than that, it, it may be true membrane failure. And these are usually rapid transporters that just, you know, as soon as the glucose gets in there, it dissipates and the, you just can't maintain an osmotic gradient and therefore they have crummy ultrafiltration. 
So what do you do with those rapid transporters? Well, again, don't forget the intake part of the equation. You can use more hypertonic dialysis solution. Icodextrin is good for these kinds of patients. Because it works on a different physiologic principle, it tends to be almost as effective in rapid transporters as it is in slow transporters. And this just shows you uh, ultrafiltration curve for all the different transporter types to show you that it, it does work in people with all different transport types. So you can give them diuretics to try to push the residual urine output, leave them dry during the day, but again, you have to think about, we just know that if a patient is anuric and you leave them dry for like 15 or 16 hours during the day, it tends to be not enough dialysis for them. Once they're anuric, you've got to watch for volume overload, and if the patient is, has ultrafiltration failure, anuric, and consistently volume overload, I really introduce a conversation about transitioning to hemodialysis because we know it's not healthy for patients to be consistently volume overloaded. So output dependent means mechanical failure of the dialysis procedure. This is supposed to show you a patient who came to clinic complaining of marked protuberance of her abdomen, which was something new. And on CT scan, which I'll show you in the next hour, you can see that there's, uh, this is the PD fluid with, with uh, dye in it, and it's leaving the peritoneal cavity right there and going out into the soft tissues. So this is a leak of peritoneal fluid through a hernia into the soft tissue. So this is an example of a mechanical problem leading to uh, fluid overload. So our friend Marvin, uh, is, who was on the very generous re regimen and doing great, but by about a year later, complains about uh, some puffiness of his ankles, and he now has hypertension. His serum creatinine, which a year ago had been 10, is now edging up closer to 14. So what fits Marvin best? The increased serum creatinine reflects a failure of, of transport of creatinine across the membrane. He has peritonitis and he's a rapid transporter. The new onset hypertension is likely the result of acquired renal cystic disease, or both the increased serum creatinine and the peripheral edema can be explained by a decrease in residual kidney function. Good. So uh, an increase in serum creatinine uh, is much more likely to be due to a fall off in uh, residual creatinine clearance of the kidneys than by any kind of problem of creatinine crossing the peritoneal membrane. If peritoneal membrane transport characteristics change over time, it's that they tend to become more permeable to creatinine, not less permeable to creatinine. So if you see a patient whose creatinine is going up and up and up, uh, unless it means that they're not doing their dialysis, but the, probably the likeliest thing is that their renal creatinine clearance is going down and down and down. So how we can help Marvin at this point is uh, salt restriction, push diuretics, and like I said, there's different things you can do with that last fill to help, and that might be refreshing the osmotic radiant with a midday exchange, icodextrin, or what we will do sometimes is do a last fill with icodextrin, leave it in till about dinner time, and then change there to a, like a 2.5% until the patient goes on to the cycler at night. Lots of different things you can do. Again, discuss it with the patient and make sure it fits into their lifestyle. So let me just go over the important points again. The PET test helps to characterize the dialyzing membrane of your patient. A rapid transporter has got increased vascularity of the capillary networks that are perfusing or super, superfusing the peritoneal membrane. These rapid transporters will, will move solute quickly, but it also means that glucose gets absorbed more quickly and they will have problems with ultrafiltration. The low or slow transporter has slower removal of solutes. Everything goes more slowly, but they have 
have consequently better ultrafiltration. And I didn't mention it, but if someone, no matter what their transport type, gets PD peritonitis, that is an acute inflammatory state, and they will become a more rapid transporter over the course of the peritonitis because there's acute peritoneal inflammation. Short PD dwells can lead to sodium sieving or the removal of more water than sodium and therefore avoid these kinds of short dwells if you can. Everyone's chasing after the KT over V urea, but short dwells are really not good for our patients. In fact, residual kidney function, one of the advantages of PD is a more, predict a more important predictor of outcome than dose of peritoneal dialysis in every study that has looked at this. So we really have to try to run interference for our patients and protect the residual kidney function. And don't obsess about KT over V urea. Get to the minimum target, including the residual kidney function in your calculation, and obsess about other things like protecting the residual kidney function and trying to maintain euvolemia in your patients. Thanks very much. Questions? Yeah, front. Uh, it's very interesting. We did a study. The question is. Uh, why does icodextrin eventually stop working? And there is breakdown of icodextrin into its sub-metabolites that occurs very slowly. But in some people, you'll get ongoing ultrafiltration for like 16 hours. We've had some patients, we've given them one icodextrin a day. So the question is, if the cost wasn't a, an issue, could you do one icodextrin a day? The thing is about the solute removal. Still, you know, if you have two liters of icodextrin in 24 hours, you, you may get a little bit of ultrafiltration, but you're only getting two liters clearance of the other stuff. And I've tried to do that in patients where there are lots of social issues and stuff with one icodextrin a day, and uh, I, I got the feeling it wasn't enough dialysis. Where it is good, is in patients with cardiorenal syndrome who may have a residual GFR of like 15 or 20 mils per minute, but they're in and out of the hospital every two months with, with heart failure. We're putting more and more of those patients onto peritoneal dialysis and giving them one icodextrin overnight. They ultrafilter about 800 mils or something, and they do really well. Yes. Uh, on what, sorry? No, I'm not discussing it in, in the next lecture, so go ahead. So the, the, did everyone hear the question? Okay, it's about hyponatremia in PD patients, and are you pretty sure it's not due to volume overload, and would icodextrin be helpful? So first of all, you're absolutely right. It is not usually due to volume overload. And in fact, we, we looked at that too and found that, if anything, you don't see the weight going up before the patients d develop hyponatremia. You see the weight going down. So it's probably a marker, I think, of intracellular solute depletion in the malnourished patient with sodium movement from the ECF into to the ICF. So it's sort of a poor prognostic sign when they're hyponatremic, and I think it's because it, it reflects malnutrition inflammation. If you're really keen to treat hyponatremia, in fact, it's the opposite. You should use a 4.25, because you'll get a lot of sodium sieving, and you'll get water removal in excess of sodium, and you'll correct hyponatremia. I wouldn't do it for that reason, but it happens to work out that way. We've seen that in our heart failure patients who are hyponatremic, and if you give them uh, not icodextrin, but a hypertonic PD solution, because of sodium sieving, you're removing water in excess of sodium, and so the serum sodium will, will correct towards normal. No, I don't think it's an indication to move them off PD. I mean, I think these are malnourished, sick patients. They're going to be malnourished and sick on hemodialysis, except they won't be getting like 400 calories a day, which may be important for them on PD. 
question? Yes. Okay, so the question is about ACE inhibitor or ARB for residual kidney function. So people seem to think like to avoid it, and very often as patients are progressing through CKD four and five, it will come off uh, because of the high creatinine, maybe they're hyperkalemic or something like that. And um, uh, there were two, there are two randomized controlled trials, one with ramipril and one with val valsartan, looking at the effect on residual kidney function. One study was a year, the other was two years, but they both showed remarkably similar results that the patients that took the ACE or the ARB had better preservation of residual kidney function compared to those that were on same sort of antihypertensive therapy, but not including ACEs or ARBs. So uh, I recommend that if you do want to treat a patient with an antihypertensive drug, I would give, uh, if you can, I would say to use an ACE or an ARB over other uh, antihypertensive drugs. So it's two randomized controlled trials. They're, they're small studies, but they were well carried out. And it makes sense if you can extrapolate from the CKD population. And if anything, PD patients, if they run into potassium problems, they tend to become hypokalemic, not hyper. So you don't really have to worry about that aspect of it with the ACEs or the ARBs. Okay.